Welcome to church. Second service, Grace Place. You guys ready to praise Jesus in this place? Yeah, we got three people ready to go. I'm just kidding. Hey, if you're visiting for the first time, we're glad to have you with us. We want to make sure that you feel welcomed. And, uh, and if you have any questions on what goes on here at Grace Place, maybe you're like, okay, they have a crazy worship leader on the front that says hi to us weird every week. Um, that much I got. There's other questions that you might have. There's an orange container outside. It's our Connect Center. And uh, out there, there's some really very friendly people that can answer all those questions, show you how to get connected here. Or you can scan the QR code right there on the screen, and that can also get the ball rolling for you. Well, today we're going to jump into some praise and worship. We're going to jump into the Word of God. It's our final series on idols, and um, I'm just excited for what God has in store for us today. Who's ready for that? Yeah. All right, so we're going to just, we're going to shout it out. We're going to sing as loud as we can, all right, because I think that God likes a loud, exorbitant voice, even if you sound bad. He loves it. It's all praise in his ears. Um, and uh, one of my songs we're doing today is Gratitude. And I'm telling you, sometimes I just love, I love that song because it, it tells me, hey, you have to make a choice. There's a line inside of you. Let that song out, right? So before we even jump into that song, let's just go ahead and make that choice right now um, and say we're ready to just give God everything we got. And we're going to take all of our ideas of what this moment in time was about to be about. And we're just going to say, surrender it to you, God. Whatever you want for me in this moment in time is all that matters, right? So God, we give you today, we give you these songs, we give you these melody lines, we give you all the tech, all the, the message today, Lord. We pray that you just come and have your way in every single space. Lord, let the name of Jesus resonate loud in this place. God's people said, amen. Let's do this. Come on.
I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do But every song must end Throw up my hands, pray.
hearts to your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. I suppose you think that was terribly clever. Come on, Gandalf. Did you see their faces? There are many magic rings in this world, Bilbo Baggins, and none of them should be used lightly. It was just a bit of fun. Oh, you're probably right, as usual. You will keep an eye on Frodo, won't you? Two eyes. Yes. As often as I can spare them. I'm leaving everything to him. What about this ring of yours? Is that staying too? Yes, yes. Say an envelope over there on the mantelpiece. No. Wait, it's... here in my pocket. <laughs> isn't that... isn't that odd now? Yeah. After all, why not? Why shouldn't I keep it? I think you should leave the ring behind, Uma. Is that so hard? Well, no. And yes. Now it comes to it. I don't feel like parting with it. It's mine. I found it. It came to me. There's no need to get angry. Well, if I'm angry, it's your fault. It's mine. Precious? It's been called that before, but not by you. How? Oh, what business is it of yours when I do with my own things? I think you've had that ring quite long enough. You want it for yourself? Bravo, Baggins! Do not take me for some conjurer of cheap tricks. I am not trying to rob you. I'm trying to help you. All your long years, we've been friends. Trust me, as you once did. Mm -hmm. Let it go. You're right, Gandalf. The ring must go to Frodo. It's late. The road is long. Yes, it is time. Bilbo. Hmm? The ring is still in your pocket. Oh. Yes. Oh. I've thought up an ending for my book. And he lived happily ever after, to the end of his days. And I'm sure you will, my dear friend. Goodbye, Gandalf. Goodbye, dear Bubba. Have you seen the movies or read the books, Lord of the Rings? If not, why not? It's a great story filled with lots of great lessons, including the one we just watched. Of course, if you know the story, it's all about the ring. It's about the power of the ring over people, and it brings out the worst in people. Evil people become more evil, but they have powers now when they have the ring. And even good people who have good motives are, are willing to try anything to to achieve their motives if they come under the influence of the ring. It enslaves. It controls. 
And it, it is something that deforms people, even one of those characters, Gollum, who loved to say, my precious, <laughs> became completely deformed. And it, it, it really illustrates for us the power of idols. All of us are influenced by something that is struggling to be number one in our lives if we don't identify it and defeat it. We've been in a series on idols, modern day idols, counterfeit gods. Who is your God is the question we've been asking. And the best messages I ever present are ones I preach to myself first. And, and that's what I've been trying to do during this. And I've been encouraging you to have an open heart during this series to, say, to just listen to something God might convict you of that is competing for first place in your life with him. You saw Bilbo there struggling. He was a good hobbit, but he's struggling to let go of that ring. And it, it's like any enslaving addiction. He just knows he needs to let it drop, but he struggles to let it drop. And finally, when it hits the floor, it's with a thunk. It doesn't bounce and roll away. It's intended to communicate the heavy weight of an addiction, of an idol. Uh, and so we think about these uh, idols and and. Uh, it's not just a little sub theme in the Bible. It's a major thing. All through the Bible, major theme. 223 times in the Bible, the word idols appears, but so many other times, the concept without even mentioning idolatry. All the way from the golden cow there at the foot of Mount Sinai at the beginning of the story, all the way through to <clears throat> Paul out planting churches, and he comes to Ephesus, or he comes to, excuse me, to Athens, and there's idols everywhere, and he points it out, and he says, I even saw a tomb to an unknown island, an idol, an altar to an unknown idol, an unknown God. In other words, they wanted to make sure they, they had everything covered. They, they had idols for even the unknown idols, unknown gods, to make sure they were covered. This is a theme throughout Scripture because idolatry basically is the root of all sin. It's under every sin. It, it's when we find our fulfillment, or we seek to find our fulfillment, our significance, our identity, our self-worth in anything besides God. That's idolatry. And that is a temptation, not just then, but now. And it is a temptation, not just for unbelievers, but also for believers. And uh, so let's be really thoughtful and serious about what God might be wanting to reveal to us today. And I hope that you'll, you'll open up your heart to the Holy Spirit's uh, convicting voice. You know, when you get to, uh, to the basics of what really does God want us to know, he's given us what he called top commands. And they're a little differently expressed in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. But in the Old Testament, you could say the top command is the first of the big ten, the Ten Commandments. And it says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's the first thing God communicated to his people that he wanted them to be clear on, is he will not be okay with competition for the throne. And the second commandment actually says, um, anything can be an idol too. As we've seen in this series, when a good thing becomes an ultimate thing, that can become an idol. And so that's the first of the 10, and every one of the rest of those commands is, is about the same thing, is about idolatry, and just it manifests itself in different ways. Then when you get to the New Testament, people actually ask Jesus, what's the most important command? And he said in no uncertain terms, he said, here it is. It's love God with everything you got, with your head, with your heart, with your strength, with your soul, everything, love God first and love your neighbor is the second command. He said, so the top command in a negative way is don't have other gods in the Old Testament. The new covenant, it's the same thing. He just turns it over and makes it positive and says, love God first. And actually that's the, that's the secret to, to defeating idols is to actually start loving God more than you love anything else. And so that's where we want to put our energy. That's where we want to put our effort. Why does God warn us so much about idols? I'm going to take you through a number of different verses. Most of these uh, talks, we've been rooted in a passage and a story, but today we're going, to, we're going to do a little systematic theology, go other places around Scripture and put together the theme. Why does God warn us so much about idols? Jonah 2.8 tells us, those who cling to worthless idols, they seem so precious, but they're worthless. 
Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. Not only do they turn away from their love for God, but they turn away from God's love for them. You see, God loves you. He loves every single creature on this planet, and he loves humans, every human, supremely. And, and he wants a relationship with you. He wants a relationship that you, that you choose. He won't force it on you, but he knows if you cling to worthless idols that you will turn because they will steal your affection. They'll overpromise and underdeliver and always enslave, but, 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 you, but when we go after them, we, we don't believe that will happen to us. We think we'll just find satisfaction. There's this passage in Ezekiel 14 where God's talking to his people and he says, you've set up idols in your hearts. That's what he sees. That's where it starts. You know, not just bronze statues that you bow down to. Idols of the heart. And then he says there in uh, Ezekiel 14, I want to recapture the heart of my people. That's a beautiful thing about God that he, he wants, even when he sees us wandering, even when he sees us with wrong priorities, he loves us so much he wants to recapture our hearts. You see, God designed us for worship. He created us that way. He chose that. It's not a question of whether we will worship. It's only who or what. And, and so everyone is a worshiper because God created us that way. We're wired for worship. And I'm thankful that he did that because of his love. He created us sort of, we like to, to talk about our soul having a, a God-shaped vacuum or our hearts having this, this hole that we're, we're always trying to fill that. And, we, and no matter what we try to fill that emptiness, that void with, if it's not God, it doesn't work. And, and, and humans just keep after it, keep trying. I know I went through a season of that, and, and that's a tendency, but it never works because lasting fulfillment, lasting peace, lasting significance only comes from a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Amen? God desires our worship, and, he, and also he desires an undivided heart. So easy to have distraction and division in our heart, but we can't have God on the throne of our lives and something else on the throne at the same time. He won't, he won't uh, put up with that. He must be supreme. In fact, God says, I am a jealous God. He, look at this, Exodus 34, uh, 14. Do not worship any other God for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Now, some commentators suggest with, with good research and reasoning, that the word jealous here could perhaps be better translated for today's readers from the Hebrew to the English as zealous, a zealous God. Because in our uh, language these days, jealousy tends to have only a negative connotation, right? When you hear the word jealous, you think of, of synonyms like envious or resentful or, or possessive or grudging or suspicious, and God is none of those things. But if you think of God as a zealous God, and you translate ze jealousy in that connotation, we're talking about enthusiastic, fervent, passionate, ardent, earnest, devoted. That's a description of God. He is loyal to us. And he asks us to be loyal to him. So much so that he says when we worship other gods, that's like prostitution. Because throughout the scriptures, old and new, he talks about his relationship with his people being like that of a sacred covenant marriage, like a, a, a bride and a bridegroom. Like, and he says, I'm, I'm your husband and you're my bride, you're my people. When you turn to idols, it's prostitution, it's adultery. And he uses that language repeatedly because that's the kind of intimate, deep relationship he wants with us because he loves us. <laughs> In fact, just eight verses before the verse I just read you where he describes himself as a jealous God, he says this to Moses who wrote these words down. He says in Exodus 34, 6 and 7, here's how he describes himself. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Aren't you, aren't you glad that he's that kind of a God. That's how he's revealed himself to us and he proved it through Jesus at the cross. It's a privilege to worship a God like that. But in this fallen world, idols are a constant attraction, an, an allurement, a distraction. 
Uh, and the words of, of Deuteronomy 11, 26, I'm going to read to you, they are not just for primitive people in a faraway pagan society. They are for civilized people today in this pagan society as well. Listen to this. God says, be careful or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. You will be enticed if you're not careful. He's talking to his people. And this appeal continues throughout the New Testament as well. There are exhortations made not just to unbelievers, but to believers that still apply to us today, such as 1 Corinthians 10, 14. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. Don't babble in it. <laughs> Don't flirt with it. Run from it. And, and you notice here, <clears throat> idolatry is not just a problem for unbelievers, for those who don't follow Jesus. Oh, it's a problem for them too, because everyone who's not following Jesus is an idolater, because you can't not worship. Everyone is worshiping something, and if it's not Jesus, it's an idol. And so that's obvious. But these exhortations to flee from idolatry in the New Testament are written to believers, because this is something that every one of us needs to be conscious of. Every one of us is attracted to in some way. When, you're, when you are trusting in something else besides God for your ultimate meaning and significance and fulfillment, that's an idol. And a lot of times it's easy for us to say, my, my intellectual trust is in Christ. Obviously, I, I know he's who he said he is. He's the Lord. He's the Savior. But we can say that our intellectual trust is in Christ and still have our functional trust day to day in something else. Our functional trust, our day-to-day -day level of trust, if it's in our achievements, if it's in our reputations, if it's in relationships, if it's in our strengths, our status, our possessions, if it's in our smarts or our good looks or, or, or anything, then it's an idol. The famous 19th century philosopher, Soren Kierkegaard, said this, it is the normal state of the human heart to try to build its identity around something besides God. That's our normal default. If we are not careful, it will happen to all of us. It's sobering to notice how the disciple John ends his little letter, his first John, we call it. Um, John was a disciple of Jesus who wrote the Gospel of John, the fourth Gospel. He wrote Revelation, the last book of the, of the New Testament. But he also wrote three little letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And 1st John is just filled with beautiful statements about God's love for us and about um, the gospel and about how he wants us to treat other people with love like he's treated us with love. And it, it's just all about um, basically how to be in vital fellowship with Jesus. And then the very last verse, it seems so abrupt. It seems so out of place unless you really think it through. The very last verse is 1 John 5, 21. Dear children, keep yourself from idols. And if you read the context, he wasn't even talking about that right before it. And he just all of a sudden, boom, I'm, I'm done writing. What's the most important thing I can say? And this is what he says. Dear children, keep yourself from idols. He ended intentionally that way under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to help us see that the most basic question of God for humans is, a, is, is to ask, who has your heart? Who has your heart? Have you put your functional trust your preoccupation, your loyalty, your thoughts, your delight, anywhere else besides God as number one? If so, that's idolatry. Uh, St. Augustine, many, many centuries ago, said, idolatry is worshiping anything you ought, that ought to be used or using anything that was meant to be worshiped. Now, as we've gone through this series, this is the last, and this is week six, we have identified some obvious idols. You know, money, sex, power, you know, politics, family, uh, success, winning. Uh, but there are so many others, and some of them are not so obvious. And so what I want to do as we wrap up today is talk to you about two types of hidden idols, okay? The first type is idols that might be hidden from me. I'm not aware of something that has become too important to me. And I want to be open for God to convict me if that's the case. And I hope you do too. 
In fact, that's what I've been praying throughout this series for myself first, and then for you, is that we would have open hearts to listen to what the Holy Spirit might whisper to us in terms of how we can draw closer to the Lord by uh, letting him replace idols in our lives. And so this is a meaningful prayer to me. I want you to look at it in Psalm 139. And I'm going to read it to you, and then later I'm going to invite you again to read it with me if you want to make it your prayer. The psalmist says, search me, O God, and know my heart. That's what this is all about. It's about the heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Are are you willing to honestly pray that prayer and be open to whatever the Lord will show you? That's a good posture to be in. And um, I'm going to mention a few categories where there may be an idol in your life or someone's life or heart that you never realized was an idol. But as as I read through, I jotted down a number of these. As I read through these categories of idols, the Holy Spirit might reveal something to you that's not on the list. Somebody came up to me after the first service and said, God really convicted me during that message that I have an idol of, and it wasn't anything that I said today. And that's that's how the Holy Spirit will work if we'll be open and we'll be humble and we'll be receptive. So consider three categories of idols. First, personal idols. Remember, anything can be an idol, even a good thing. In fact, especially a good thing if it becomes an ultimate thing. And so what things might you be tempted to make an ultimate thing out of personally? Uh, I'll, I'll rattle off a little list, but it's not, it, it's not conclusive. Uh, there's money, of course, is, a, is one. Possessions. Jesus said where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. And so that's one way to see what you value most, what you're afraid of losing, what you think you must have. Uh, then there's the, the potential idol of romance, a love relationship, a spouse even, and, and uh, I have a, a really good marriage and a great relationship with my, my wife, and I value that so much. But when you have a good marriage, there's going to be a temptation to make your spouse an idol. Children, as we've seen in this series, is one, that's one of the top uh, idols in America. If you're finding significance through your children or your grandchildren, and, and if they're fulfilled, you succeed. If, they, if, they are, uh, if they're not fulfilled, if they're successful, you, then you feel like you're fulfilled. And, and if they don't succeed, then you feel like you're devastated because you're putting too much, too much priority. What about power, control, success, winning, achievement, career? <clears throat> you know, we, we talk about child sacrifice in the, in the ancient times, but there's a lot of modern child sacrifice happening in, in worshiping the career idol today. And so many other examples of personal items, of beauty, looks, clothes, body, image, you know, um, weight, appearance, all these things we can make an idol out of of so many things. What else can you think of? Hobbies, recreation, entertainment, uh, technology, social media, news and information. You know, I, I love learning and I love researching and news, but I can do deep dives that I don't need to do, uh, you know, because of technology is being, and so much information being available. Sports, a lot of people, that their main place of worship is in a stadium. Um, escapist behavior, addictions to anything, to food, to alcohol, to drugs, to sex. Uh, comfort. Did you know that just comfort is, is one of the major idols in the West, in Western cultures where we are, um, have more opportunity for comfort? The list goes on. Think of another category, religious idols. Now, you might not have ever thought about this, but just briefly, I want to share with you what Tim Keller points out as three potential religious idols. The first is truth. Truth is a good thing, but it can be an idol if you're resting in your rightness of doctrine rather than the work of Jesus. Proverbs talks about scoffers, and scoffers are those who are always right, and they can be disrespectful, disdainful, and mocking towards their opponents. It's possible that your theological rightness can be an idol. Um, Gifts can be an idol. You, You might mistake your spiritual gifts for your spiritual for spiritual fruit and feel like 
Um, you know, if I'm successful in ministry, I can believe in justification through ministry. I know I'm in God's will because I'm serving or I'm, I'm doing something that's working in ministry. That can be an idol. Morality can even be an idol. As important as that is, it, it's typical for Christians to feel that God should and must love them and bless them because of their moral record. Look, look what I'm doing for him. He needs to do something for me. And uh, Martin Luther insisted that failure to believe that God accepts us fully in Christ is to look for something else, for, look to something else for salvation, which is idolatry. One more category to think about as you're kind of thinking through what could be a potential idol is the cultural idols. And these change with generations and places, but like during the Enlightenment, science and reason were considered the solution to the world's problems. And so human reason became a cultural idol. Today, individualism, individualism is a cultural idol in the West. And uh, different cultures in different places, like if you go to more traditional cultures, family is an idol. And they do honor killings and treat women as property and so on. But in our culture, it, the individual has become an idol. And that means no one can tell anyone else they're wrong. An ideology can become an idol. Uh, socialism communism, capitalism, democracy, conservatism, liberalism, other isms. A generation ago, atheists were trying to take over the world and killing anyone who opposed. Today, you look around the world, you see religious zealots some places trying to take over the world and kill off the infidels. And they're all driven by ideological idols, different idols, different generations, different locations. In our country, as you know, there are two major political idols represented by conservatives and liberals. And they, they see things completely different. The same things they look at, they see different. Conservatives see private enterprise as a savior. And so they want to see lower taxes and promote business. And uh, liberals tend to see government as the savior. And so they want to raise taxes, give everyone health care, and so on. Listen, neither system is a good savior because people are corrupt, whether in business or in government, and the pendulum swings every 48 years, doesn't it? Back and forth, and we learn that neither idol saves us. And uh, at the same time, they certainly do divide us <laughs> and sometimes control us if we're not careful. So, you know, we're in election series, as we all know, and we need to keep reminding ourselves of this as we go through the rest of this year. And uh, we are convict, convicted and convinced and persuaded as followers of Jesus that we are a part of another kingdom, right? Yes, we have, we have dual citizenship. We're citizens here in America, but we're also citizens primarily and first of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, Amen. And so uh, that's where our first allegiance goes, not to, not to a country, but to the kingdom of God. And, and so we're not going to put our hope and our trust in any idols, including these um, political idols that are so apparent and so uh, div uh, div div cause so much division in our culture today. And we don't want to let that into this church because we're about Jesus when we come here to worship. And I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat or a Libertarian or whatever other party might be out there that's going to not, that's going to lose. <laughs> I don't care. Because when you come in here, we're, we're, we're here to be about Jesus, okay? You, you should be convinced about what you believe and you should vote, but we don't have to divide the body of Christ over those things. Are you with me on that? Because so many times that becomes an idol. Amen? So, if the Lord is revealing any idol that is fighting for first place in your heart right now, or maybe it's fully established in first place, or maybe it's just something you wrestle with, be honest, be prayerful, be open. And it doesn't have to be something I just rattled off in that long list, okay? It's whatever God's convicting you of that you struggle with. So we're going to put this verse up again, which is this, this prayer from Psalm 139. And I'm going to invite you if, if you, if you're serious about this, 
to honestly pray this prayer with me now. Let's pray, let's pray it out loud, and let's, let's ask the Lord to show us what we need to see. Okay, here we go. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. That's a good prayer to pray and keep praying. Now, I want to invite you to, if you will, to become even more vulnerable for a few moments and think about a second category of hidden idols, and that is idols hidden from others. We talked first about idols that might be hidden from ourselves, and we need to be, or we need to be convicted by the Holy Spirit to recognize that. But now I want to talk to you about idols that you already know about, but you don't want anybody else to know about. Maybe it's a hurt, hang-up habit. Maybe it's addiction. Maybe that's, you know, what Hebrews calls the sin that so easily entangles. And, and so let's think about this. If you have an idol in your life that you're, you're trying to keep hidden, I would encourage you to consider two important biblical principles, okay? Number one, my secrets make me sick. They might not make me physically sick, but they'll make me spiritually sick, they make me emotionally sick, and they can make me physically sick when I'm hanging on to secrets. In Psalm 32, uh, David reflects on a time where he had a hidden sin in his life. And he says this, so descriptive, verse 3 and 4. When I kept silent, this is about his secret, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. He's praying to God. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Notice he's saying, when I hid my secret, I got sick. I wasted away. My strength was sapped. Emotionally, spiritually, physically, maybe all of the three above. A bigger problem than what you eat is what's eating you. And uh, that's something maybe you're hiding, a secret. It'll make you sick in some way. Hiding never works. And if you hide it, it increases. Sin grows in the dark, not in the light. It gets exposed in the light. And so it, whether it's a fear, a hurt, a habit, a, a memory, a, a, you know, a, some kind of sin, whatever is a secret, hiding it just intensifies it. The more you hide it, the more you do it. But David continues in Psalm 32 in verse 5 and says, Then I acknowledge my sin to you. That is so important to identify and acknowledge and admit. He said, I acknowledge my sin to you, God, and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. That's a beautiful reality. And notice, it is to the Lord that we confess our sins for forgiveness. But as you'll see in a minute, if you want more than forgiveness, you also want healing and recovery and breakthrough and victory. You may need to confess your sins to more than the Lord. We'll come back to that in a minute, okay? But you confess your sins to the Lord for forgiveness. Confessing is admitting our secrets, okay? So here's a second truth. First, first we, 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 we want to not hide our, uh, because that will cause us to be sick. Our secrets make us sick. Second, I must admit it to defeat it. If you want freedom in your life, then you've got to name something that, is, that you need delivered from. A sin, a fear, a resentment, a hurt, a habit, a hang-up. It starts, freedom starts by admitting it, okay? Look at Proverbs 28, 13. You will never succeed in life if you try to hide your sins. Confess them and give them up, and God will show mercy to you. We tend to waste an enormous amount of energy trying to hide our hurts, our faults, our hang-ups, our habits. And that will just drain you of life and sap you of energy. My secrets make me sick, so I've got to admit to defeat. Uh, Lamentations 340, let us examine our ways and test them and return to the Lord. That's what we've been trying to do in this whole series. Examine our ways and test them and return to the Lord. Maybe there's something in your life that you've tried to hide and you're ashamed of it. Maybe, maybe you, you know God knows everything, theoretically you know that, but, but to, to 
admit something to him that, is, that makes you feel shame or guilt is, is, is causing you fear because you don't know how he'll respond. I want you to remember, God is not impressed with pride, with cover-ups, with pretending. What he's impressed with is when we're willing to be honest and vulnerable and broken. And we, we know that because he told us that. Look at Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is close to the what? Brokenhearted and saves those who are what? Crushed in spirit. Isn't that good news? God is not turned off to the weak and vulnerable. He draws close to them, it says. He's attracted to that when you're like that. God can't help us if we are spiritually pride and unwilling to be honest and just playing games. We've got to admit our need and come clean before him. When we confess our sins to God, it's for forgiveness and for clearing up something that could negatively affect our relationship with him. But if we want more than forgiveness and we want healing and breakthrough in our lives, here's the next step. Confess to someone else for healing. And I think this vital, vitally important uh, principle is found in James 5, 16, where it says, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be what? Healed. You see, you confess your sins to God for forgiveness. You don't need to go to a priest. You don't need to go to anybody for forgiveness. You go to God directly. And, and, and Hebrews says we can come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain, or to the throne of mercy, or obtain grace in time of need. And, and we come to our high priest, Jesus, and we go directly to him for forgiveness. But, but this text says we can confess or admit a reality, a, a hang-up, a hurt, a habit, a sin, an idol, to someone else for healing. Now, that's hard to do, but it feels good afterwards. There's something cleansing and liberating about appropriate confession. If you want forgiveness, tell God. If you want healing, tell a trusted person. It might be a paid counselor. Nice thing about that is it's illegal for them to tell anybody else what you told them. <laughs> It might be a, just a strong friend that you trust, that you trust with your life. You need those kind of people in your life, other believers, uh, a, a, brother, a spiritual brother, a spiritual sister that is not going to think less of you, but actually going to think more of you that you trusted them with heart issues and ask them to be an accountability partner and a prayer partner in some area that you want to see the a grip of, of the enemy broken, whether it's the the flesh, the world, or the devil, they're all after us and want us to turn to idols. And so confession can be a wonderful breakthrough opportunity. And don't tell everybody, but tell somebody that you trust. This is a bridge to cross for healing. So as we, as we close this series, I want to say to you again, as I've said a number of times, the way to defeat idols in your life is through the gospel. It's through the cross. It's by receiving his gift. It's by contemplating his sacrifice. It's by recognizing what idol worship, my idol worship, cost Jesus and putting him on the cross. And it's by asking him to take first place and it's by learning to love him more than anything else. I encourage you to put your energy there. Not in better willpower or trying harder, but in loving him more. Because the more you love him, the more that will crowd other idols out of your life. We're going to close our series and our service today with communion. I have a few more things I want to say to you, but I want to invite the ushers to come forward in case you want to participate and did not receive uh, a little packet that will enable you to take the bread and the cup. And I'll take one of those too. Thank you, sir. Now, as, as we've seen, one of the major themes in the Old Testament is idolatry, but God often talks about his, his people being adulterers. That, that's how he looks at idolatry because he wants such a close marriage-like relationship with you. He calls it adultery when you turn to other idols. And there were these 
these two Jewish scholars who did a study of idolatry in the Old Testament exclusively. They don't believe in the New Testament. So they, they wrote a whole book on their research. And in the book, they exposed a dilemma. And, and they said, okay, the law demands death for adultery. That's what it says in the Old Covenant law. But a husband loves his wife. And so if a husband's willing to forgive her, there's this conflict. The law says, stone her. I mean, the same goes for the men, but I'm just using this as an example. And the husband loving his wife says, but I love her and I want to forgive her. And there's this dilemma. How does God face this dilemma when his people are spiritual adulterers who deserve death, and yet they are also his beloved bride, and he wants to forgive them and save them and be with them forever? These Jewish scholars noticed this dilemma, but finally concluded there's no resolve for that dilemma. It's just a contradiction. There's no, there's no resolve. And that's because they're stuck in the Old Testament, unfortunately, because the, the solution is found in the New Testament, and it's the cross. At the cross, God punished our rebellion, spiritual adultery, and idolatry in Christ, but he also at the same time displayed his love and saved his bride. How do you get rid of an idol? I'm going to say it again. It's not just by trying harder. Idols are replaced more than they're removed. The answer is not just to stop loving that idol. The answer is to love God more. And if we grow our love and our appreciation of the Lord, our Lord and Savior, idols are pushed out. When we contemplate more and more and appreciate at a deeper level what Jesus did for us on the cross, we start to love him more. And listen, that's why these spiritual disciplines that we talk about all the time and have been talked about all throughout all history are so important. Things like prayer and Bible re reading and reflection and coming together for worship like this and choosing to live with some other believers in meaningful community and so on. These, these spiritual disciplines are so important because our goal is to love God most over everything else. And this is one of the ways we do that because our minds and hearts are constantly being either conformed or transformed. Either conformed to this world or transformed by the renewing of our mind through a relationship with God. One or the other. And every one of us is struggling with this every day, every week. We're starting a new series next week for four weeks for June called Sweeter Than Honey. And we're going to talk about the importance of allowing God to speak to us through his word, through the Bible. And we're going to be honest about the fact that the Bible can become boring. It can become just a kind of stale. It can become a history book if we're not reading it with the right heart and the right methodology. But it can be sweeter than honey. Those are the words of the psalmist when he described the words of God. He said, they're sweeter than honey. Yea, it's the honeycomb. And so let's talk for the next month about how we can get really practical about getting closer to God and loving him more, especially through his word. We're going to be we're going to get very practical, and I think it's going to be a, potentially a, a, a good refresh for all of us. Now, we're going to pray, and then we're going to take communion. So before or as we pray, you might want to have both of those little lips or those little... Uh, little uh, flaps open for the wafer and the cup. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your incredible love for us. Thank you for what you've revealed about yourself in the story we, we find in the 66 chapters or books of the Bible. Thank you, Jesus, for going all the way to Calvary's cross for us. And please forgive us for our distraction, for our, our attention to the wrong things in our life. Thank you for your forgiveness. And I pray for anybody here who needs a, a breakthrough, for an addiction, for a, a hang-up, a hurt. And uh, some of them maybe need help through a counselor or a support group. But... May it start right now with full surrender and a desire to love you more than anything else. And Jesus, the more we appreciate what you did there on Calvary's cross for us, the more our hearts are filled up with love and with 
a desire to worship you alone. And so we make that commitment today as we thank you and we confess and we repent and we ask for breakthrough in our lives. In Jesus' name, let us eat and let us drink these emblems of his body and his blood broken and spilled for us. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I want to invite you to stand with me before we sing. And uh, we're going to end this series the same way we began it, with a statement of affirmation of what we know to be true as followers of Jesus. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, don't feel like you need to read this. But for all of you who are, I'm going to invite you to look at the screen and read this out loud with me. Two passages beginning first in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And so let's go ahead and put that on the screen. And let's read this together out loud as an affirmation of truth, okay? Things we know. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. These are things we know. Now let's go to 1 John chapter 5. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Dear children, keep yourself from idols.
many of you want Jesus to be number one in your heart, in your life, in your home? Lord, you see our hands, you know our hearts. One of the things that is important for us to do if we're going to put him first is put him first in every area, including with our resources. And that's why every week we remind you about giving being a part of our worship, just like our prayers and our songs and our, our learning from the word. And we remind you that our tithes and offerings are one way. We, we serve the Lord, we worship the Lord, we honor the Lord, we put him first in that area. And you get, don't give to Grace Place, you give through Grace Place. And we always put up the options in case somebody's new and doesn't wants to get involved with our website, texting, giving boxes in the back. Hey, before you go, a couple things. First of all, we, we're doing a uh, story time for little kids here the last Wednesday of every month. That means this Wednesday at 9 a.m. Also, Birthday Day Parade is Saturday, and if it's a big deal. If you've never been to Birthday Day Parade, no matter where you live, drive here because it is a big day. It's a cool parade. You can root for our uh, breakaway parade, uh, float that's going to be in the parade, our breakaway camp float. And uh, our we're, Grace Place is sponsoring the Kids Zone at the park. If you want to go there and check it out. Also, breakaway prices go up at the end of this month, so get those registrations in. We have hundreds of kids already, but we have room for more. Get your neighbors, get your, get your kids' friends, as well as your kids and grandkids registered. And uh, as always, we got prayer partners back in this corner if you'd like to stop and pray with somebody. It's been great to worship with you. God bless you. Go in peace.